live channels television event. All of the investments by all of the uniquely collateral partners, support system, and references that have brought together this vision to a place of very distinctive positioning within the matrix and the national grid of investment in the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the power of convergence here in Kaduna State. Kaduna State has a singular statement, work and workship. And the power of workship is total devotion to a patriotic service, call and delivery of results through enterprise, governance and the advocacy of integrated engagements. Congratulating once again Governor, his team, and Kadipa, because it couldn't happen without the resolve of a team to deliver and to serve the vision of their principal. Today, this subject matter for the plenary is on the opportunities in transforming the agricultural sector in Kaduna State through a magic word, a magic reference which actually is much more than magic. It's a very deliberate investment of thoughtfully resolved actions all around the African continent and leadership, the African Free Trade Agreement. Today, for the purpose of this, we're looking at a background of agriculture for Nigeria and with a spotlight on Kaduna State in particular, with an increasing population third in Nigeria 5% of our total GDP when it comes to Kaduna State is the presentation, not just of funding, but of investment. And this is the target of Kaduna State because right now it's at 2.5. The role of agriculture in the economy of the state therefore cannot be overemphasized, accounting for 36 point 69% of the state's GDP in 2018 with 2.45 million hectares of upland and 0.89 million hectares as lowland. The state has been blessed with arable land and the major crops, maize, rice, guinea corn, soya beans and beans are all gold star A rated on the global commodity market. Kaduna State is strategically located, being a link state in the far north and a link to the south from the far north. And this has allowed the state to grow. Grow not just as a center of learning, but as a commercial nerve center city. The Africa Continental Free Trade Area agreement was signed in 2018 with the goal of creating a big market for Africa and the opportunity to trade amongst African countries. Yesterday, His Excellency, and as well as a presentation from after itself, Afrexim, emphasized that the two convergences in Lagos and Abuja had set up a singular format for what today in CAD Invest 6.0 becomes the next intervention from Nigeria. This portends, therefore, great opportunities for agro-businesses here in Kaduna State and connected to and through the opportunities of the Kaduna State agro-enterprise. Ginger production, maize production, UNECA estimates that with the implementation of the AFTA, inter-African trade will increase by 52.3%. Kaduna State is positioning itself to take first position on that after regional engagement. It is therefore on this premise that this plenary session will look at how Kaduna State, the entrepreneurs, the partners, the investors can and will maximize this opportunity in the agribusiness for both SMEs and institutional investors through the AFTA 
and looking at CAD Invest 7.0. So actually, this is about formatting the platform for CAD Invest 7.0. I would like to invite to be seated our distinguished, eminently collateral panelists. I'd like to invite MD, Nigeria Export Import Bank, Nexim, Abba Bello, with over 30 years experience in banking, he has held senior management positions in corporate banking, regional and commercial banking, public sector banking, attended several courses in Nigeria abroad on leadership, advanced management, and right now is advancing very, very strategically the ship of a reset Nigerian import export representation. You're very welcome, Mr. Babello. We also have Francis Anatogu, a Secretary General AFTA, Specialist in International Trade, Market Access, Trade, Industrial Policy, and Diplomacy. The word today is AFTA, the power of AFTA, and the communication of all of that reference. The Head, Department of Economics, Nile University, Abuja, and Lecturer at the National Open University of Nigeria, with numerous publications on trade and investment, help me welcome Dr. Gailich Jelilov, founder of Farmhouse Lagos, an experienced, celebrated tech consultant, blockchain solution architect, driving social impact projects. He founded the Farmhouse Club, an ag tech setup, startup, which utilizes the blockchain to connect local farmers to global supply yeah. CAD Invest 6.0, help me welcome Uche Yeshua Chugo. He is also an alumni of the Harvest Harvard Business School. And we have yeah. representing Kolamasha, the CEO, Babangona, Elijah Ishaku, AGM Field Operations, an award winning social entrepreneur dedicated to solving Africa's leading social challenge with leadership experience across four continents. Numerous companies received several global awards, including the prestigious Eisenhower Fellowship and Rayner Fellowship. Please welcome Babangona, the big farm and the big farmers. But is it about a big farm or big vision? I have a stellar representation here. And even as they are seated, I'm going to start with what is institutional and what represents the advocacy of our nation when it comes to agricultural redeployment. Abba Bello, over to you, sir. I have to run this as quickly as I can run it, but I know I have the right CEOs with the trainers on, ready, set, to go. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir, over to you, Abba Bello. When we talk about the agricultural sector and after, what is the thrust? What is the drive? What is the institutional vision for Nigeria from Nexa? Um, good morning, everybody. Let me, let me stand on protocol that has been established. Um, first of all, maybe I think it's very important that I say what Nexim is about and what Nexim does. Now, Nexim is the export credit agency of Nigeria and also the export development bank of Nigeria. So basically what we do is we facilitate and promote export of Nigerian produce, Nigerian manufactured goods into the global market. Now, over the years, agriculture has formed the core of Nigeria's export out non-oil export. Basically, all exports out of Nigeria, in fact, 90% 90, 90 of exports out of Nigeria are either agri-commodities or agro-allied manufactured commodities. So, agri has always been very key and central to Nigeria's export. But it has also been very key to the um, Nigerian economy as a whole. It is the largest contributor to the GDP for the SMEs. Why do I say so? Despite the fact that services today 
contributes 50 or 55 percent of Nigeria's GDP. Agriculture, the second largest, employs the largest workforce in Nigeria. So for us, agri has always been a fulcrum of support to uh, grow the Nigerian economy through export. African continental free trade area has come in, and how can Nigeria, and particularly Kaduna State, take advantage of that? The first thing we must establish is that agri-commodities in Africa are homogeneous. What we produce in Nigeria is actually what is produced around the neighborhoods of Nigeria. The countries around Nigeria also produce the same commodities, cocoa, grains, um, cashews, and so on and so forth. So, the country with the coming of AFCFTA, the economy that will benefit most from agriculture is the one that takes agriculture beyond commodities and into processing, um, thereby creating a comparative advantage. Now, the Industrial Master Plan of Nigeria has provided that Nigeria already has an advantage in industrialization and we must ensure that we stay number one within the regional industrialized uh, West Africa, where we are already number one, and becoming number two in Africa. How is it, uh, how would Kaduna State benefit from that? I think from what we have heard since this investment summit started, Kaduna State is in, going in the right direction. Why? Because it has provided the atmosphere for investment to come into Kaduna, number one, in ease of doing business, um, and CAD Invest, as is going, the conversations are going, the benefits and advantages of having Kaduna as a cluster for uh, industrialized agri agricultural processing is becoming more and more clear. Okay? So we think that Kaduna stands at the center and has the advantage of becoming an industrialized hub for um, distribution of African, uh, within Africa, of processed agricultural Thank produce. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause help me appreciate that very, very robustly profiled and summarized intervention. Yes, at the core of Nigeria's export and all of our positioning on global markets when it comes to the agri-economy. That is the defining reference for Nigeria outside of the emphasis on oil as the mono-export reference of the Nigerian economy. Dr. Gilek Jelilov, you are an expert in trade and investment around agro-enterprise, national enterprise. Now, within the context of the given security threats and the issues challenging that as related to the value chain of delivering agriculture, as a forefront representation for Kaduna and all of that which is now being re-collateralized with this knowledge-based economy. What is, your, what is your interpretation of how we should direct this for Kaduna State and for Nigeria? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I believe Kaduna is doing very well, first of all, why? Uh, because um, we call it signaling in economics. When you are going to go for the job interview, uh, you are standing, you talk, not shaking, being confident. All of these are more efficient than your uh, just resume, basically. So when we, when we see the forefront, the whole Kaduna uh, management government here, uh, including His Excellency, bringing out the investors at the same time, the government, the stakeholders, all together, and trying to find out uh, what are we going to do next year. And uh, I have seen a lot of improvements, including uh, the car industry. And yesterday, I was really happy to hear about the tomato farm, uh, yeah. tomato factory. Why? Because tomato was one of our examples in economics. While we are traveling, uh, half of your uh, final goods are spoiled. And it was a huge problem. I mean, in agriculture, logistics is a problem. 
And I think uh, solving it, solving in the future some aspects in the fruit, uh, it will create a lot of value chain. That's number one. Number two, you say security aspect, right? Uh, security is unfortunately is nowadays is little bit of an in increase in the hike, and uh, when you say uh, being number third in uh, population in Nigeria is already creating you some doubts on how are you going to absorb that amount of people uh, because you need to make them uh, in I mean earn their own money otherwise they are always going to look for somebody's money right. That's where the concept of kidnapping and all these insecurities is coming up. So um, one of the unique sectors that you can absorb the labor is agriculture. And you really have a lot of vast of land. Uh, from the reports I have seen, you already have a lot of um, production. But uh, what I think in the future, um, if you create a lot of um, favorable um, investments in agriculture like giving uh, fertilizers, giving cheap credits, things like that. I'm sure uh, agriculture is going to be leading in, in whole Nigeria. Uh, I mean, Kaduna is going to be leading because land is here, people are here, and being nearby to the center, uh, although the, His Excellency always <laughs> joking with Kano, but I think uh, Kaduna is, I mean, uh, competing. I mean, it's not, it's, it's very good example. I mean, uh, competing with a state of 20 million population is, uh, is a good example. So, um, agriculture, I think, is number one getaway of the security challenge. Human, land, and uh, making them, giving them... Well, thank same. you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jelilov. And like you said, in the place of securitization, if we work with agriculture absorbing power of the human resource that we have in numbers, we're able to direct, as it were, the, um, the heart of the people with the right socioeconomic investment, then we'll actually be able to create a level of empathy with the economy. And I was talking with Ishaku um, concerning the small farmer holdings. I said, give us, give us, give us the facts, give us the figures, you know. You are looking at the issue of um, blockchain, right? How can blockchain technology um, be? Well, no, no. Let me let me keep that for let me keep that for Uche, right? In terms of the blockchain. But what I wanted to look at is small farmer holding. You were talking to me about how bringing together all those people makes the difference with not just the community in the rural, but the impact translating to the economy in urban, national, and African reference. Remember, we're looking at after. And the after reference now with your small farmers. I'm sure we're going to start getting those pictures coming up soon. Let's see those pictures come up on screen. Pictures from Babangona and all of that social enterprise through the power of small farmer holdings. Ishaku. Thank you, Dio. I think uh, the role that the rural smallholder farmers can play um, in uh, taking advantage of the opportunity in um, Africa continental trade uh, area can never be overemphasized. Uh, especially the first speaker had talked about um, us looking at boosting our productivity and the second speaker also talked about the role that the youth can play. Okay, let me get you louder now. Which is where Babangona is basically focused. Uh, today, in Babangona, 98% of our workforce um, for the, for the uh, um, organization are all youth below the age of 40. And when you look at our farmers, we've grown in the last 10 years from 100 farmers to today 84,000 farmers. Cumulatively, in the last 10 years, we have been able to uh, support over 130,000 rural smallholder farmers. And despite the security challenge, you will see that we've still been able to grow. 
Um, I really want to appreciate the Kaduna State Government for giving us the enabling environment. At 70 percent of our operations, it's um, here in Kaduna State. I want to, I'd, I'd like you to be that. I want to thank Kaduna State for giving you what? The enabling the environment. The enabling environment. So there is an enabling environment in Kaduna State, in the farms, and with the youth, it has redirected their restiveness. Definitely. Um, to be factual, you know, just like oxygen is to fire, that's how unemployed youths are to insecurity, right? And we are projecting that by 2030, about 80 million youths will have moved into the workforce. Now, if we don't get these youths engaged, we are simply looking for trouble. Right. And we have to suffocate that oxygen, which is basically what Babangona is doing. Um, rural uh, uh, settlers, young folks that are just coming out of school, Babangona have been able to give over a thousand of them employment. We're looking at these harvest uh, opportunities for almost 2,000 youths to come support rural smallholder farmers, apart from about 30% of our 84,000 farmers that are also youth. And basically, we have to make agriculture attractive to the young folks, right? The, the youth have always looked at agriculture as a very, um, uh, as a venture that does not give good return on investment, which is what Babangona is trying to change right um first focusing on improving the, the yield of the rural smallholder farmer typically looking at maize for instance uh, the national average is 1.6 uh, tons per hectare and south africa is doing six tons on average why can't we as a as a country babagona today on average we're doing four tons and we are also constantly looking and innovating on how to get our rural farmers to that six tons and that is the game changer for me i think um, if you look at our, our maize production today nigeria is a six billion um as a uh, uh, dollar uh, uh, maize uh, uh, economy, right? And, and we need about 15 million tons in terms of uh, uh, the demand. But we're only able to supply 10.5 uh, million uh, tons of, of, of maize within the country, meaning there is a gap in supply. And it's only when we bring in these youths, we encourage them, we show them that agriculture is actually the game changer I think in the introduction today and recapping some of the things that was done yesterday, we're able to touch a little bit of it on how to make youths begin to look away from white collar jobs and now taking advantage of agriculture. And I think for me, if we improve productivity, we make agriculture look creative. Other governments or states taking the part like the like Kaduna State Government have taken to provide that enabling environment we will be able to get there. Well, thank you very much. Please help me appreciate it, Shaku. As we love to say in Nigeria, it's one thing to package your market, but what is principal is how to market your package. So getting the youth to repackage themselves so as to repackage the market, not just for the locality, but indeed for the global, integrated, and intercontinental opportunities as we will find. I'm coming to you, Dr. Anna very soon, but you know, right now, you know, just looking at this, because it's very important that we are able to translate, you know, the second verse of the Nigerian anthem says, help our youth the truth to know. What are the facts? What are the realities? And how are these being communicated? We can conference on this, we can summit on this, we can do all of that, but it has to be packaged in a way that the youth are ready to become the principal drivers of the principal tractors, not just the hoes, but they're able to see themselves in that attractive expression, not just of the white collar, but of being agropreneurs, youthpreneurs, drivingpreneurs of a new enterprise. It's all knowledge-based, and the beauty of having a new youth-driven agro-alignment is that it will be digitalized because the youth naturally the sixth finger is the digitalized finger with which they connect to the whole world well we're talking digital 
intelligence, digital blockchains, digital opportunities. Right now, CAD Invest 6.0 is all about digitalization, the sustainable knowledge-based economy. Uche, talk to us. That which is digital from Harvard to the farmlands of where? Kujeni, of you name it, talk to us. How can blockchain technology be leveraged in line with AFTA for Kaduna State and for the youth of Kaduna State coming into agribusiness and other related opportunities in that value chain? Thank you. Thank you very much. So if we think about the blockchain as what the SWIFT network is to global banking, we can then begin to paint an accurate picture of the technology's potential in enhancing, in enhancing agribusiness in the state, especially in line with the AFCFTA. Currently, a number of bottlenecks are stifling the rampant expansion of agri-export trade, not just in Kaduna, but in Nigeria as a whole. Uh, but the blockchain, given some of its attributes, promises to free the sector of the golden handcuffs of engagement it has hitherto operated with. Attributes such as trust, transparency, and traceability uh, play a, a strong role in, in positioning agri-produce coming out of the state as, uh, you know, as favorable in the, in, the, in, the in the trade agreement, in the free trade agreement space. And traceability provides reliable data such that uh, consumers can track the journey of the, the, the food from pro production to process, or to who processed it, um, especially as uh, food provenance is now a growing concern for, for consumers, and food fraud is also at an all-time high. Uh, Nestle, I was just reading on the way here, has pledged one billion dollars to promoting sustainable agricultural practices that promotes carbon sequestering. Uh, the blockchain can facilitate uh, um, you know, the, the, the tracking of farms that are actually sequestering carbon. So this not only affords uh, revenue streams from, from selling the produce, but also from selling carbon credits as well. Uh, the tra the tra uh, trust and transparency aspects of the blockchain overlap to create an environment of confidence. Colin Powell, a f former statesman, U.S. statesman, once very eloquently put it when he said, capital is a coward that fle flees from obscurity. You know, so it is important to build an environment of trust such that uh, we can attract foreign direct investment. The Ethereum network is the second largest blockchain network, and it has currently amassed in its six years of existence $125 billion already. Blockchain is that again? Could you... The Ethereum blockchain network. All right. It's currently amassed $125 billion by way of smart contracts and decentralized finance, or DeFi, uh, these are, these are low-hanging fruits that the states can easily tap into if it incorporates the blockchain in wow. its process. Awesome. Have you, been, have you visited the data center here at the, in Kaduna yet? I haven't. I must admit it's my first time in Kaduna. I think we will have to organize that you visit that so that you can situate, as it were, the intellectual property of this opportunity into that so that the triple T's that you've mentioned in terms of trust, transparency, and traceability can be part of the initiation of that which follows through the value chain and manages it in the space of sustainable, knowledge-based, driven enterprise for the agricultural platform. Well, we'll be coming back to you, right? Thank you very much. And um, we trust that diasporally, the connections too that bring this home will bring it to not just the farms, but to AFTA. So, AFTA is here with us. We couldn't have a better voice and a better translator 
of all of the components. This is the go-to specialist when it comes to conversations around international trade, market access, trade industrial policy, and diplomacy. Secretary General, after Francis Anotogu, talk to us. Thank you very much. Um, just a uh, um, first uh, couple of clarifications before I go ahead. So my role, I'm um, the Secretary General of AFCFTA Secretariat is based in Ghana. It's Wam Kelemene. I am the, uh, the Secretary of the Nigeria's National Action Committee on the AFCFTA. And I'm a senior special assistant to the president on public sector matters. Secretary of the National Action, Action Committee, Committee on, on implementing after, after, after for, exactly, Nigeria. for Nigeria. We are still our go-to person. Yeah. Um, let me start by saying, what is the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement? And what, what value is it to us? Why should, we, why should people be interested in it? So, it is a set of rules on how we trade. The way um, trading in a domestic environment and trading internationally are two different things altogether. Um, when you're trading uh, uh, internationally, you start thinking about um, documentation around uh, um, um, uh, uh, standards, start talking about uh, uh, the rules and a lot of documentation in addition to what you need to, uh, in, in addition to whatever thing you need to do and you also now think about what the import country requires versus what you require uh, in your own domestic environment so the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is an agreement to set a set of rules. And in the phase one, we have an agreement on trade in goods, trade in services, and you also have a mechanism for settling disputes that are, that are bound to happen in, when there's a trade. Now, but what does it offer in practice to us? Why should we bother? It promises uh, li liberalization, which is removal of duties on 90% of tradable products. It promotes what I'll call African content. So rules of origin, what, is, what does it mean? It means that for products to be classified as AFCFTA products, they must have a minimum African content. Uh, so if you don't meet these criteria, you will not, um, you will not benefit from, the, uh, from AFCFTA. The third thing that AFCFTA provides uh, is opportunity to harmonize regulations opportunity to harmonize standards and look at it in simple terms. If you, are, uh, if you want to do anything with maize in Nigeria, you need to satisfy uh, NAPDAC, you need to satisfy SON, you need to satisfy NAQS, that's a quarantine service. If you now need to take the same product to say Egypt, you need to satisfy the equivalent of, of Egypt. And today, they are all different. So what AFCFT is trying to do is to try to harmonize all of these. Now, why, why also is this important? Africa market, Africa imports about 60, $600 billion of products every year from the rest of the world. Most of them are, are value-added products. So if you think about it, that's $600 million, uh, billion dollars of opportunity for Nigeria and other African countries. Now, 
if you then instead of sourcing if you if if, if maize or maize product is an input to your manufacturing process if you go to let's say brazil and source it and come and use it in your product in your production here you will not get advantage of this liberalization but if you source the same product from say uh, ivory coast and you now want to sell it in south africa or somewhere that duty element is gone so that gives you opportunity to um to compete now what are the things we must bear in mind when we now start talking about uh, uh especially now talking about Kaduna state so already from what we've heard yesterday and this i've already known this we are ready the platform is there but for you to be competitive in export trade you need skill and we've looked at at afcfta and our charge and this is the conversation that we're having with state is you know we have the security we have all the issues but can we we need to start thinking about the post oil world today nigeria's uh, export that makes salt the, the giant of africa is just about 60 billion dollars of oil that is just 10 percent of africa's import can we target that even in the next 10 years can we divide that value uh by 36. so for you to now start saying that you're, uh, you're doing export, Kaduna State, every state should be targeting to uh, export capacity of a minimum of a billion dollars. A minimum of a billion dollars. Oh, Mr. Governor, Deputy Governor, man. And every, can we do this? And every, Is Kaduna ready to do this? And, We've and, been given a figure. And every, and every state uh, based on uh, our natural endowment, we have a population of 200 million, right? Um, um, we, we, we are talking about, um, we are already hearing about investments. So with the people we have, with the capacity that we are building, so we now need to focus on specific ecosystems. And like Professor Monga said yesterday, you know, we tend to, or people or countries tend to, um, focus on diverse sectors and products but if you can bring it down and say yes it's good for the domestic doing whatever everything we are doing for the domestic market um, focus on many sectors and, or, and areas but for the export can we choose a product can we choose a service can we build ecosystem around these services and product and this product and services and then take it to africa by the way what you need to do to get to Africa is what you need to do to get to the rest of the world. If I'm, you take, just one last one, if you take your soya, the, 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 the world uh, um, import of soya, is, the world is almost 100 billion. I think it was in 2018. Africa is, is maybe about 10 or, or even less. So the market for just soya alone is big, but we now need to move from soya, just soya, the raw commodity, to all the derivatives of soya. And if you now, and if you now focus on it and say, yes, we have this, this uh, uh, investment in a soya plant, focusing on this segment, can we then get other segments aligned? And you build the ecosystem, you build the people that will make Kaduna if you talk soya, you talk Kaduna. I like that expression. If you talk soya, you talk Kaduna. Well, son of the soil, please let's appreciate once again Francis Anatogu, the secretary for the National Action Committee for AFTA in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If we talk soya, let's talk Kaduna. Let's talk son of the soil, Ababelo Kaduna, son. Now we are talking from soil to global economies, like we just heard Francis say, once you can take it to Africa, package it for Africa, create the currency, the exchange, the paradigm of double, triple T, transparency, trust, traceability, you get it to the African brother, where east, north, middle, wherever, south, Africa, 
you can take it to the world. But the beauty of what we are packaging for the world, our product, our productivity, is that we own it. Now, in owning it, through your institutionalized governance and direction and drive, perhaps the currency that takes it from an African to an African without a dollar exchange in between. How can this work? Can it work? It must work. It should work. Ababelo, tell us how to make it work after aligned. Thank you. It certainly can work. And it certainly can work. It Thank certainly you. can work. And there are already effort um, through Afro Exim Bank and uh, various central banks across Africa to create PAPS, which is an exchange where because of numerous currencies across Africa, trade has always been difficult. Uh, payment systems don't exist, in addition to other challenges. But Afrexin Bank and other central banks under the auspices of Africa Union is trying to solve that problem, where we can trade in Naira for an import from Ghana. Okay, And there is a clearing system which is what PAPS is supposed to be. But beyond that, AFTA is supposed to be uh, the integration of Africa for trade and movement of people. Okay, and uh, payment system is not the only challenge. Uh, I think Francis has already mentioned the need for certification, standardization, and various other um, regulatory uh, challenges. So even with the liberalization of trade between borders, there needs to be some certain standards that need to be um, met for each product, especially agricultural products, okay? Because there are standards that need to be met right from input to in where it is even uh, agro-processed. There needs to be standards that are fit for consumption in other countries and certification. So, while it, has, it is always said that exports of non-oil products is low because of lack of financing, while that is true, but financing comes after all the standards, all these certifications and so on have been met. So we have challenges or issues that can be tackled, okay? But we need to put the right infrastructure in place, okay? Uh, storage, we need to put uh, logistics, different models of logistics, sea, rail, and so on and so forth. To that, all this coming together is what provides the finance to support, and indeed investment, to support agricultural exports into the rest of the world. And he is right. What you package for Africa is indeed good enough for the rest of the world. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Please, let's appreciate another round of applause there because in hearing this, what we hear is a simple summary. Once the product is right, not just ripe, once it's rightly packaged, the finances will come, the investors will come, the market, the economies will open. Dr. Jalilov, what's your wrap-up statement and engagement with this subject matter on after? Well, uh, certification is very important, as you say. Um, sometimes you are buying milk, and you have some tools to measure how the milk is good or bad. If uh, a government is not doing that one, uh, the certification or checkup, each citizen, which we are talking about 200 million people, should have all those tools to check up, and it's expensive. So what I mean, um, if middleman, which is the government, will set up the standards and check it up for us, it will be easier for us and cheaper to consume. That's number one. Number two, uh, logistics, I think, uh, perhaps is the biggest uh, threat for the agriculture. Um, we, I actually travel from Abuja by train and it's very beautiful and I think we need to have the same uh, very good specialized wagons for agricultural transportation. It's number one. 
uh, because when when we see during pandemic uh, when the online uh, business has grown up i mean i think jeff bezos had around a uh, uh, trillion dollar for his wealth during this pandemic i mean it means uh, online works uh, we have seen in the countries where they have a very vast network of uh, distribution um, working very well and the online trade for those countries has been working for example uh, uk has their own royal uh, post system which is distributing goods for online purchase at very minimum cost when you are buying something in nigeria jumia has their own uh, distribution system congo has their own which is quite increasing the cost of distribution so i think uh, online distribution, which is post office, should be developed. Uh, I, I have seen 80 billion have been invested in uh, land uh, transportation road system, and the place I have stayed, I have seen the vast um, um, repairments on the road and those drainage system, which is quite expensive. But I really want to congratulate uh, His Excellency and his team. Uh, Transportation road, transportation air, transportation trains, especially for Nigeria and Africa as a whole, should be developed very well. And in that case, I believe uh, you wouldn't be able to buy so many things from abroad. And one of the things I would like to say, I have been in Kenya and they are producing a lot of flowers. Yes a lot of flowers. Let me give you some data. Uh, one meter square of flowers, uh, depends on the type, can bring you from $1,000 to $2,500. One meter square. I'm talking about a million and million and a half income from one meter square. Right? It's very important. And Kaduna is having very favorable weather. Uh, not different from uh, Nairobi or not different from South Africa, which is actually one of the leaders yeah. as well in uh, flower production. So I believe uh, transportation, logistics, storage is important. And yes. once you do that, it will grow up. Thank you very much, Dr. Jalilov. Um, which I could see nodding your head when it comes to the issue of the value chain, blockchain comes to the whole issue of standardization of the movement of the product and how we're able with the right kind of intervention. Yes, what we're talking about, all the development we're seeing in Kaduna is the Kaduna Urban Renewal Project that ongoing right now has the city breaking up all kinds of areas just to establish a whole new terrain of connectedness for logistic movement of people, of resources, and coordinated. So um, we continue to celebrate all of the initiative of Kaduna State. But Uche, over to you very quickly, because I'm going to have to rush us through now. What's your take coming from Dr. Jellylove's um, intervention? I think, again, the blockchain comes into play um, and should be given the opportunity to really show its prowess with regards to standardization so would you say that the blockchain intervention now should really manage this process should begin to repurpose as it were reset this entire process exactly i think from inception we should be looking at the blockchain especially with its capabilities of integrating document transfer traceability trust and transparency um it, 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 I, I don't undermine Africa's ability to leapfrog when it comes to technology. And uh, this is an opportunity for uh, Africa to again demonstrate. Uh, and we're not going to lose or miss this opportunity. Absolutely. No, we're not. So also I have to create an opportunity very quickly for the last comments from Francis and Ishaku. Thank you very much. I think um, at the National Action Committee, we have looked at what will it take us to successfully implement AFCFT and we came up with seven goals. One that I talked about earlier is producing what we're going to export and I've given you the target. The Two. second, which is ties into the, the theme of this, is uh, uh, developing the, um, the workforce right, to 
to accelerate the productivity that we need to become through a digitalized not just digital the people the people all right the human and resource the people not just for the 200 million but for africa 1.2 billion economy great and three the third one is engendering a friendly business environment and that Kaduna is already doing with right. their governance but also important is automating administrative processes all right others. four the fourth one is infrastructure and we've talked about it five the fifth one and very important is that we have a big domestic market 11.8 percent of the total import of africa so we have to hold on to our market here increase it on our right? market so, look so inward. For, for a state like Kaduna and for our states we need to catalyze our domestic environment government Six. offtake okay. um getting the big companies just having taking actions policy actions and other actions to okay that's that. been done that's how come we are here now six okay. and seven the sixth one is we talked about market access mm -hmm. it's about deliberately uh making ourselves known in the market with our products so yes when you talk of nigeria some image comes to mind but if you talk about kaduna anywhere you go into africa something and in terms of a product yeah that's re-emphasized here because yesterday it was said it needs to be more visible so we need to brand seven Kaduna. the seventh one which is what we're already doing the uh is about making sure that the afc fta works well so the rules of origin compliance trade remedies uh, administration and all of that sir over to you let it work make it work help us make it work thank you ishaku i have to cut this off now so just very quickly let it end thank you so, thank um, you i think uh just to borrow from Mr. Francis, his first and second point about productivity. Um, uh, very, very important that we improve our productivity. I was just looking at the statistics in cotton. For instance, look, looking at back from 1970, China was doing 1.1 million tons. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? So our productivity, so, yes. So yeah, more investment in the smallholder farmer. Okay bottom of the pyramid actually holds that okay. if, if we must improve our productivity okay uh, then the reason we're here is that productivity is the thrust of the kaduna state governance and the intervention for going forward from cadinvest 6.0 to cadinvest 7.0 to the world please help me appreciate all of the panelists here today and let us remember that the government even though it drives the process as the principal entrepreneur in this, the intervening middleman, the most important man is not the government, but it is the citizen that makes the difference. Please once again, a round of applause. Thank you very much for the policy. Can we please come forward for our picture, inviting the governor, deputy governor, and um, royal highnesses, please join us for the pictures up front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate.
Thank you very much. We'd like to acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Minister of State for Mines and Steel Development, Dr. Ucheoga O.O.N. Thank you. We would now like to invite for his speech, the Vice Chairman Kadipa, our distinguished guest speaker for day two, His Highness Mohamedou Sanusi II. Please a round of applause as we welcome and receive him upstage. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Your Excellency, the Governor of Kaduna State, Malam Nasser Ahmed Arufai, Your Highness, the Amy of Zazzo, Ahmed Nuhubamali, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, my presentation today is on the theme of this summit, which is transitioning to a sustainable knowledge-based economy. And let me begin by way of setting a context by congratulating the Kaduna State Government for thinking ahead, as I said yesterday, for looking at the future and for preparing the state for the crisis that we are in and the crisis that is to come. Your Excellency, you have taken a number of difficult and unpopular decisions. Decisions that every economist will agree were absolutely necessary to place this state on the path of fiscal sustainability, reducing the cost of governance, attracting foreign investment, encouraging private sector participation in the economy, and as I said, taking serious political risks in the short term in order to secure the long-term future of the state. And these are the decisions that this country needs to take. And you have provided leadership and given an indication of the kind of leadership that we need if this country is not to go bankrupt. My prayer is that after you finish your term, whoever succeeds you will build on what has been done. Uh, because as we know, it is very easy for all the work that's been done in years to be destroyed in one day. We have seen institutions, we have seen um, strong institutions unravel within a few months of having the wrong leadership. Uh, so I pray uh, that Allah grant the people of Kaduna leadership that will continue to build on the work that's been done so that the future generation will benefit from all the work that we're doing now. These things need time. And we'll see with the examples we give that the countries that did this, um, did this over 20 years, over 40 years, um, but it started at one point with one leader. So I begin my presentation with a slide I referred to yesterday. Now that slide basically tells us why we are going the way we're going. You have countries and their per capita GDP, and we have resource-rich countries and countries that are considered knowledge economies. 
On the horizontal axis, we have the knowledge intensity. On the vertical axis, we have per capita GDP. And all you have to do is look at the direction of the dots to see that as you become more knowledge intensive, your per capita GDP increases. As an example, look at the countries that we here consider rich countries. Look at Saudi Arabia. Look at Bahrain. Look at Kuwait. We consider these very rich countries. And that's, the, the, that's where they are on per capita income. Now compare Saudi Arabia to Singapore. Or to Finland or to Switzerland, or to the US, or even to the United Arab Emirates. You know, we all think Saudi is richer than UAE, but look at the per capita income. And what is the reason? The UAE is further down on the global knowledge index. They are at 58, while Saudi Arabia is at 44. So, if there is any evidence that this is the right path, this is the evidence that you need. As you increase the knowledge intensity of your economy, as you rely more on human capital, as you rely more on intellectual capacity and less on natural resources, you reduce poverty and increase per capita income. And that is what uh, you're supposed to do. So, the next slide basically starts with a definition which we've heard from the Vice President yesterday on what is a knowledge economy. And we have a number of illustrative definitions. It's one where you have a greater reliance on intellectual capabilities than on physical inputs or natural resources. The OECD defines knowledge-based economy as one where advanced economies are uh, basically moving towards greater dependence on knowledge, information, and high skill levels. While the World Bank defines a knowledge economy as one that creates, disseminates, and uses knowledge to enhance its growth and development. Now, globally, work is being redefined. 30 to 40 percent of workers in developed economies will need to significantly upgrade their skills and reskill into new occupations by 2030. Now, what are the major drivers of this redefinition? There's digitization and remote working, which we have seen even here with COVID. There's increased automation and artificial intelligence. Uh, very soon, the robots will take over the work in many countries and those that will have jobs will be those who are able to operate the robots or manufacture the robots or, um, uh, or, or service the robots. And you have decarbonization. For us in Nigeria, um, the enclave economy we have, the so-called goose that lays the golden egg is about to die. There will be no eggs. The future is not in hydrocarbons. A few months ago, Germany was able to produce enough renewable energy for its entire country's needs. Today, we're having difficulties selling Nigerian oil. The United States, India, they're not buying. So not only are we not able to produce, even if we produce, the market is not there. Um, so, this is forcing a change. And for us, a country that has depended on oil, this makes the, the, uh, the change even more urgent, more pressing. Now, on the right, I have further issues exacerbating the situation with Nigeria. Only 9% of new graduates find employment. So we have an incremental 4.5 million added to the unemployed annually. This is Niger. Only 9% of graduates find employment. 41% is the number for youth unemployment. 
whereas overall we have 27% unemployment among the youth, it is 41%, which is the most serious um, component of the population because that's where you have restiveness, that's where you have thuggery, that's where you have crime, that's where you have insecurity. Nigeria is ranked 114th in the Global Innovation Index. We are lower than other African countries such as Kenya, such as Rwanda and Senegal. We are in fact ranked 14th in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think we should have these reality checks and know where we are as a country. Let's not, we continue calling ourselves, um, what do we call ourselves, the giant of Africa. Huh? We are the giant of Africa. We are a giant with clay feet. Okay? So, we are 14th in innovation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Countries like Senegal and Rwanda and Kenya are ahead of us. I'm not even talking about South Africa. Our federation, our expenditure as a country on education is only 7% of the budget. 7%. We're spending less on education than Ghana. I'm not talking about as a percentage of the budget. In absolute terms, even though the Ghanaian economy is much smaller than the Nigerian economy, even though the Ghanaian government revenue is less than the Nigerian government revenue, Ghana is spending more on education than Nigeria. And we're surprised that companies are moving to Ghana. We're surprised that industries are moving them. We're surprised that individuals are going there. We're surprised that the Ghanaian president has become the leading uh, president in Africa. We are not investing in education and human capital. We have a 68% mismatch between graduate skills and job requirements. The major areas being IT, communication, and decision making. And the completion rate between entry into primary one and completing university is 8%. Out of every 100 children who go into primary one, only eight end up coming out of university. And out of those eight, 9%, which is about one, <laughs> will get a job. So this is the reality, um, in addition to what is happening globally. Now, digitization provides an opportunity to level the playing field. If we are deliberate, and if we shift from consumption to value creation. I made this point at last year's um, summit. Part of our problem is that even when we have the solution at hand, we do not take it. And I give the example of the mobile phone. You know, you, you have this mobile phone, you, you paid for it, and when you bought it, it was probably produced in the UK, so that is adding to UK GDP. You sit in your room, you think you've arrived, you want to go to England, Go on the internet, buy a BA ticket, and you're happy. You send in money again to the UK, British Airways. You sit on your phone, book your hotel, nice suite, Hilton Park Lane, London, send money again to the UK. You book your car from the airport send money again to the UK. Maybe you have Deliveroo, you book your food, send money to the UK on this phone. Every single expenditure from buying the phone to using the internet has been transferring wealth from Nigeria to the UK. And then we are surprised that those countries are getting richer and we're getting poorer. Meanwhile, you could use this phone for fintech, you could use it for logistics, you could use this same technology to produce Nollywood movies, 
you could turn this phone into a factor of production, creating jobs within the Nigeria, into, in agriculture, in manufacturing, in, which is what those countries have done. And that's the difference between a knowledge economy and a consumer economy. So long as we continue taking this technology as consumption, it's like electricity. If you use, I mean, industrial revolution started with the discovery of the coal engine. It was, once electricity was discovered, it was used for industrialization in Europe. What are we using electricity for? We're watching Manchester United versus Arsenal. Air condition, lights, street lights, you know, beautiful lights. We're consuming. And that's why when you say pay electricity tariff, people cry because electricity does not contribute to their earnings. It's just consumption. So the whole idea of a knowledge-based economy is to train people to turn themselves from being consumers into being producers through innovation. So that was set in the context. And let's look at the critical enablers and consideration for Kaduna. I said yesterday when launching the plan that when I went through the plan, a number of things I'll talk about have already been considered. Um, what I would suggest is we look at what we have done and then look at the gaps and see what we need to do in order to do that, to make this transition. Now, the countries that have addressed, that have moved into knowledge economy, have addressed six key factors to accelerate this transition. Public governance is one. And by public governance, I mean not just the whole entire process of having good corporate governance and, and all that, but having a governance of the knowledge economy. There must be one point in Kaduna State. Even though this knowledge economy goes across sectors, there must be one coordinating point that drives this process from end to end. And it must be very clear that this is the point responsible for the knowledge economy. We need a regulatory and business environment. Connectivity and collaboration here, I'm referring to the entire ecosystem of players. I mean, look at Lagos. We see all the results of these companies that came out of Lagos. But where did it start? Main one brought fiber, fiber to Yaba Tech, Yaba. And around there, you had all sorts of hubs coming up, innovation hubs. And look at those companies now. I will give another example later of what's happening in Edo. And that's what we need. Have one point, you have a university. If you go to Silicon Valley, around Stanford University, you have the venture capital companies, you have all the innovators, you have um, Google, you have Microsoft, you have everybody is there. And that is what we mean by connectivity and collaboration. And we need to do that and actively promote that. Um, do a tech park. Sorry, I have to keep a... This keeps signing me out. We need talent and skills. Um, that has been talked about. Um, and again, we'll talk about it later. Uh, we need support. And support is not just money. So I'll give you an example. Um, yesterday, the governor spoke about the statistics in Kaduna. Data is one of the most crucial support that you can give an entrepreneur for innovation. If somebody wants to innovate in the health sector, they need to know where can I find data on the people that use medical services? Where can I find data on the location of the hospitals so that I can create, I can innovate a solution that will provide easy access to healthcare delivery or education? So access to data, uh, and I think with all the data Kaduna State is preparing, uh, we need to give the private sector access to that data. Somebody who has access to data on income distribution, for example, on people who pay taxes to Kaduna. Take a simple issue. If I know the people who pay taxes to Kaduna, I can design a credit scorecard 
and know those who are credit worthy and target them with loans even before they come and ask you know so data um, support is very important and then market access and when i say market access i'm talking about the government itself encouraging the market if kaduna state government continues to pursue its e-government plan if the government itself continues to focus on using technology and innovations activities the government itself is a big market it encourages investment in that area because people know that there is a consumer and then you then have other people come um, and log on this all enabled by clarity of what the knowledge economy aspirations are and a shift in government spending to match those priorities on the next slide and this is where we need to challenge ourselves now we say we want to be a knowledge economy but what are the clear and measurable aspirations for kaduna's knowledge based economy i have given some examples the united kingdom says they want to be the most innovative country in the world by 2030 they want to be the best place to start business by 2030 they want to raise total investment in r and d to 2.4 percent of gdp by 2027 these are clear measurable targets by 2030 we ask is the uk there if it is not there why is it not there what does it need to do to get there the netherlands wants to make netherlands one of the top five knowledge economies in the world by 2020 so they would like to be at the very right end of that first graph that we talked about they want to raise total investment in r d to 2.5 percent of gdp by 2020 clearly even more ambitious than the uk and they want to set up a 500 million euro fund for knowledge and innovation with 40 percent private sector contribution and the same thing with denmark so the point i'm making is kaduna state now has to say what are the measurable aspirations that we have by 2025 by 2030 for a knowledge-based economy and how do we move there and then to aggressively promote convene and build partnerships towards its achievement while measuring and communicating its impact you know job creation in a knowledge economy it's not about creating jobs in Kaduna, but equipping citizens to participate in the global economy. You have global platforms now that enable people with relevant skills to find employment anywhere in the world, sitting where they are. Okay, I've given two screenshots. One is called Deal, the other is called Remote. Now take Remote. You know, you can sit in Nigeria and let's say there is a company in Argentina that needs a developer. And because of the high cost of developers in Argentina, they have somebody with the same skills who is based in Nigeria who costs them less. On remote, what this platform does is it puts you together. It takes your CV it matches the needs of this multinational corporation they have a local representation they arrange the contract here the contract is arranged in kaduna you sit in kaduna you are a developer for a multinational base in buenos aires okay remote ensures that they put their card or account number or whatever so long as you perform at the end of the month you are paid your salary so you can sit here in Kaduna because you are a developer, you have been trained, you have the skill. Be employed by a company in Argentina. You don't have to look for a visa. You don't have to fly to Argentina. You sit in your house in Kaduna, you do the work, you earn foreign exchange, and you pay taxes to the Kaduna state government. This is the future of a knowledge economy. You know, we, we move away from going to look for move our CVs around looking for government job today you have somebody who has uh, a degree in information technology he wants to work in the bank 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 I have people with agriculture they want to work in the bank medical doctors want to work in the bank 
with these skills. And you know, you can be a lawyer. And with, with IT skills, you can provide legal services to a law firm in New York. You can do research and so on. So you, it's basically equipping people so that they can be useful, they can have the skills that will make them employable globally. And they don't have to move across borders. This is the wonder of technology. And it happens a lot. Um, I, I know a company, um, an NGO in um, a foundation in Spain called Profituro, and I think we've discussed this before, which has been training young Bolivian children in the jungles on STEM. They've taught them to code. They link them with European companies like Nestle. And today you have poor children in Bolivia who would have been dragged into the drug cartels and they're earning 1,500 euro a month. I mean, these almagiris on the street here, literally, can be taught how to code. You know, when we talk about all these almagiris, if you think of them as potential raw material that can be trained, teach them to code, put them into this global value chain, and let them start earning income in dollars. You transform their lives. So these are the kinds of potential that you have uh, with, um, with the knowledge economy. Um, the next slide. I'm almost through. So an example is you don't have to go very far. Right there in Lagos, you have something called Degacon HQ, which is now working with the Edo State Government. It's involved in rapid upskilling um, of developers. And what it does is it provides upskilling for software developers. It's a six-month residency, residency program. You either pay tuition up front or you sign a contract, you're trained, and then when you earn, you pay. There's a bank. A bank provides a loan. So th the bank lends you money, you, you get trained, you start earning, and you pay. They've got a very high placement rate, both locally and internationally. And they're now building a technology park in collaboration with Edo State. It's also right next to University of Benin. So these are the kinds of things that Kaduna needs to do to strengthen the ecosystem. Um, you can train developers, you can train um, uh, the knowledge skills for, for agro-processing or whatever the priorities are, or education for Kaduna State, uh, but that's what we can do. We also need to accelerate the ongoing GovTech strategy to help fund the ambition and create an enabling environment for innovation. So we work with infrastructure providers. Right now, I think Kaduna is working with Airtel. Uh, we continue with those kinds of partnerships. We should consider creating technology parks, focus on priority sectors. I've heard a lot about agriculture. Um, I was a bit intrigued yesterday when the governor said they're going to increase agricultural GDP to 40%. I thought we're actually going to reduce the percentage of agriculture and increase the percentage of the knowledge economy. But still, uh, to increase our cultural productivity, putting in um, technology, having an, a tech park that focuses on that would be very helpful. Um, enhance security. Um, accelerate digital government services. And build an ecosystem of private sector partners. World Bank Group, Microsoft, IBM, and so on. And I must say, um, to be frank, um, Kaduna has been doing a lot of this. And the world is watching. So let me, I'm going to make an announcement today. You know, yesterday after I left here, I went straight into, and as you know, I'm on the global board of the MTN. So I went straight into a board meeting. And at that meeting, MTN is starting something called MTN Education. It is powered by Google. Um, Google will be providing subsidized um, laptops. You have the Google Classroom, you have the Google, Google Workspace. MTN provides the voice and data connectivity. And at the board meeting, we were briefed that we're going to do pilots in three African countries. And Nigeria is not one of them. 
And naturally, we're, one, we're 14th in Sub-Saharan Africa, <laughs> the Global Innovation Index, so it will not be a priority. So after the meeting, I called the global CEO and said, why is it Nigeria one of your pilots? It's your biggest market. And I said, you know, I'm in Kaduna. The reason I'm a few minutes late for this meeting is I was at an investment summit in Kaduna State, which has decided to be a knowledge-based economy. And I explained to him what we're doing. And I said, I want Kaduna to be one of the pilots. So the story is, so he said, so he said, Your Highness, I'll, I'll call you back. And he called the Nigeria CEO and had a chat with him. And the Nigeria CEO called me. And the long and short of it is that MTN Education will pilot in South Africa, in the Sudan, in Ghana, and in Kaduna State of Nigeria. <laughs> So, but you see, the, the, reason, the reason, even though I'm on the board of MTN, the reason I can get that decision in 10 minutes is because of what Kaduna State has done. I can't, I can't go to the MTN CEO and say, you know, Nasir Erufai is my friend, we have been friends since teenagers, please come and do it. But when you say, this is what I have seen today, we have just launched a plan, this is what they are doing. And you add in that, you know, by the way, they are already working with your competitors, they're working with Airtello, you better, <laughs> you know, you come in. You know, you get a quick answer. So congratulations, Kaduna, I mean, this is, uh, the world is watching. And this is what you get when you're a first mover. Anyone coming to Nigeria now on this will say, which is the government that has shown seriousness, that has shown commitment in this area? And that's where you're going. And then they keep coming and coming and coming. So by the time you've got AITL, by the time MTN comes in with Google, and by the way, next week I'll bring the Nigeria CEO to you. We have agreed I'll bring him to you so that you can start um, talking about how it to be done. But this is... Um, um, again, congratulations, um, Excellency, for this. Sorry, I'm... You know, I'm talking about knowledge, but I'm an illiterate when it comes to these things. Uh, so I have a number of backup slides. Um, I don't know whether I need to go through all of them, but basically what, what I've done is I've taken three countries. I've taken Costa Rica, I've taken uh, Singapore, and I've taken Estonia and given a review of how they moved to knowledge economies, what they did. Um, I saw something from UK Aid now, uh, Skills for Prosperity. Um, I mean, in, you'll see in here that Singapore has something called um, a Skills Future, okay? And it's basically the same thing. It's about working with the private sector to develop the kind of skills that they want, change the curriculum, and make sure that people actually come out with skills that are suitable for the 21st century. So when I was reading through the UK AID uh, 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 flyer, you'd find um, practically everything in here. This is what those countries did. And also finding partners. You know, get two or three big names. Get Google. If we bring in Google and you get in IBM, by the time those two or three names plant themselves here, everybody comes. You know, and, and basically, if you go through um, what they've done, Costa Rica, Singapore, Estonia, I think you'll, and, and Estonia will be useful for you as well, as far as your e-government is concerned, because it is the model. You pay your taxes, um, you even register your companies, uh, you know, everything is done. You sign, you approve contracts, your identity card system. Estonia is the benchmark, and Kaduna State can do that. So that's basically a summary of, um, I know Uma gave me 20 minutes, I don't know. Um, so if it's, I mean, it's, it's 20 minutes by my wristwatch. So uh, thank you very much. Another round of applause for His Highness.
Muhammad Sanusi the second and wow what just what a Christmas present it's an early an early celebration and such an investment by way of the relationship currency here today not just that is with reference to the pedigree of the engagement and the profiling of the different six step interventions but most importantly the value the value chain that has been articulated here today hannah thank you very much your highness for that very very beautiful presentation personally what i've gotten from it is that we need to restructure um, the economy to capitalize on skills and value sets that are relevant to our priority sectors Perhaps a sustainable knowledge-based economy is sustained by a massive investment in R&D, as we saw with the UK, the Netherlands, and Denmark. So I think we have gotten so much from that. We thank you once again. Please give a round of applause. Um, next, we have the launch of Skills for Prosperity by S4P program, FCDO, and the signing of the agreement with the Kaduna State Government. Before that, I would like to specially recognize the Registrar General of Corporate Affairs Commission, Mr. A.G. Abakar. I would like to call on Tessa, Mr. Tessa Nyalaku, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name properly. Please, a round of applause as he approaches the stage, please. Good morning. Your Excellencies, uh, Royal Highnesses, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tese Nyulaku. I am the skills advisor and program lead for Skills for Prosperity from the British High Commission. I bring you greetings from the uh, British High Commission. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for that honorable mention uh, of Skills for Prosperity. It is really apt. And another plus for Kaduna, Skills for Prosperity is in nine emerging economies uh, across the world. Nigeria is one of them, and Kaduna is the only state in northern Nigeria that is benefiting from this UK aid funded program. The other state is Lagos, so you can see how uh, Kaduna is viewed from uh, our perspective of making the difference in northern Nigeria. Kaduna has always been that catalyst for change, and we pray that it continues to be so. Uh, Kaduna is attracting investments, increasingly so, and these investors will need the manpower to drive their operations. And to do this, you would need young people with requisite skills to be able to find a place in that process. The private sector has always posited that uh, our schools are not producing quality and relevant skills necessary. Uh, to drive their processes. In lieu of that, skills for prosperity will institutionalize formal industry apprenticeships and traineeships in production floors of these investors that are coming to Kaduna, that are coming to Lagos. So it is a very fantastic collaboration between Kaduna State Government on the one hand, organized private sector on the other, and also training providers to provide new opportunities for young people to find increased access to skills and education and also to find relevant and quality skills that would give them a new lease of life to participate in the global economy as His Royal Highness had earlier mentioned. Thank you very much for this opportunity and God bless you all.
I would like to call on the Commissioner, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Technology, please, to come on stage for the signing of the agreement. Mr. Idris Inyam, please come on stage. Thank you very much inviting the Commissioner, Mr. Idris Yang, and of course Kaduna is the only state in Nigeria that has a Commissioner of Digital Innovation. Thank you very much, sir. Am I supposed to sign or am I supposed to make no, some... Yeah. Two minutes? I suppose something to project with. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, Your Excellency, the Governor, was amiable wife. Yaisha, Your Excellency, Deputy Governor, Your Royal Highnesses, um, Captains of Industry, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of the presentation, not yet up, um, apart from executing this agreement, there was a need to quickly explain why and how we got here. Uh, so for this presentation, we intend to provide some key information about the why the partnership with S4P from Kaduna State's perspective and give some insight to the vision of the program, the strategic approach being taken and expected outcomes. The why comes with our experience challenges and opportunities. We all are aware Nigeria has the seventh largest population in the world with an estimated population of 200 million with statistics of 2019 and Kaduna State estimates sit at about 10 million people, roughly 5% of that population. Despite strong economic growth, the unemployment challenge still persists. Nigeria's unemployment rate increased in quarter four, 2020, to about 33, or by about 33.3%, from 27.1% recorded in quarter two of 2020. Youth unemployment is a general challenge across Nigeria. Recent data indicates that about one-third of Nigerian youth have been unable to find gainful employment. Relating this to Kaduna State, data from Kaduna Bureau of Statistics indicates that 54% of the state's population fall within the subject demography, which is the ages 15 to 65. This challenge invariably leads to youth restful, restiveness and promotion of vices. In recent times, job creation and quality of jobs have been marred by the dearth of requisite skills and entrepreneurial competence occasioned by poor public education and training systems, which produces skills that are not necessarily aligned to industry requirements. There is strong evidence that investment in wealth, function, apprenticeship, and skills education programs or systems can simultaneously help to meet enterprise skills needs and ease the transition from education and training to employment. Skills mismatch to industry requirements and other obstacles prevent youth and vulnerable groups from accessing economic opportunities. This is all among what is established to be a growing or booming agribusiness sector ICT and the creative industry with huge potential for scale up and provision for mass creation. What are we doing about this? The community government has identified the deliverable of high quality technical vocational education training, TVET, as requisite for the fulfillment of human capital development indices to improve the business environment and develop the technical and vocational capacity requirements of the states. TVET is recognized as a crucial vehicle for social equity, inclusion, and sustainable development because of the opportunities it offers for direct and indirect job creation in the formal and informal sectors. The Skills and Talent Strategy Committee, set up by the Kaduna State Government, therefore theorizes that strategic provision of quality TVET in Kaduna State will help develop a vibrant private sector an economy that supports job creation and, in and income generation. Mandates in include development of a comprehensive, well-articulated skills development plan 
and ensuring the development and improvement of technical and vocational education training framework while developing an economically viable skills bank in the state. The largest objective is to improve youth participation in labor force and productivity and improve employability. The gender component of this target is also to double female labor force participation and productivity in the state. This is in alignment with federal government's targets for the labor force focus in human capital development. In pursuing the attainment of this goal, of these goals, the strategic area had engaged the ITF for the purpose of implementing a more detailed survey across all 23 local government areas to cover five priority sectors, including agriculture, ICT, textile, health, and construction. Final report has been presented, and we're working on working around that, which will be to develop a quick policy guide for all skills development interventions in the state. We've prioritized provision of digital skills to enable active participation and contribution of our youth in the larger global digital economy and industry 4.0. This prioritization is taking shape in various interventions and programs, such as demonstrated by a collaboration with Zenith Bank by set up the CAD ICT hub and the most recent partnership with Bank of Industry in establishing the ICT stroke innovation hub in the state, which was launched in the month of August. The goal of this administration is to develop a job-related competencies among the poor, the youth, the marginalized, and the vulnerable within the state through the provision of high-quality vocational skills training that is diverse, flexible, easily accessible, outcome-oriented, and highly relevant to the state economy's labor requirements in the immediate, medium, and long term. The coming of S4P program, therefore, comes as a vital tool to catalyze the achievement of our goal within the short term. Our appreciation goes to, first, UKFCDO for continuing to demonstrate Her Majesty's Government's commitment to development in Nigeria, in particular, Kaduna State. We've benefited tremendously from several interventions in the past in the skills development area, the most recent being the Mafita intervention, which rounded up in March 2020. Apart from the S4P intervention, we also have the LINCS program, domiciled in Kadip with Kadipa, which is involved in other economic development interventions. We would like to also thank the program delivery partner, Palladium Group, especially the program's state manager, Amina Danjuma, who has continued to show us the necessary support and cooperation. We are optimistic that our work together will indeed achieve the set goals and objectives of the program. With the kind permission of His Excellency, the Governor, Mal Nasser Ahmed El Rufai, and Her Excellency, the Deputy Governor, Dr. Hadi Saba Balari, it's my singular honor to execute this agreement for and on behalf of the government of Kaduna State and the good people of Kaduna. Thank you. I don't have one to write to myself. So right now, please, another round of applause, even as he moves center stage for the signing of the UK aid-funded Skills for Prosperity, which is an intervention across nine African countries here in Kaduna, the driver from MBIT, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Technology, Commissioner Idris Yam, and the signing of agreement with Sybil Ferris, the acting team lead, S for P Nigeria, State Team Lead, Amina, and of course, Commissioner Idris Nyam. Please, all three to please come up stage very, very quickly. Thank you. Let's have this signed. Already we had the initial intro. Let's all put our hands together. It's a celebration of prosperity, for prosperity, and of course, working with the next stage and next phase for the knowledge economy skill sets, digitalization, creative enterprise, and all of the advocacy, networking, the youth of Kaduna State to the aspirations of CAD Invest 6.0 to the world. Congratulations once again. It is a full basket of opportunities 
very interesting part of the pictures profiling this event from the gala night was a picture of four glass coin filled um, plants where we had plants growing out of coins which were an investment and I thought to myself how apt from coins many of us forget that we are in Naira and Kobo economy from Kobos to the world so the Kobos of Kaduna growing through agriculture youth innovation and all of the digitalized knowledge-based economy on a sustainable value chain integration through very deliberate intentional government interventions and initiatives thank you very much and now we'd like for the picture opportunity to invite the governor of Kaduna State and Deputy Governor to please do us the honor of coming up stage for a picture with the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please let's put our hands together and celebrate again. It is a launch of Skills for Prosperity, the s for p program, FCDO, and signing of agreement with the Kaduna State Government. Kaduna State Government here, the driver in this advocacy and implementation is none other than the office of the Honorable Commissioner of the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Technology for Kaduna State, Commissioner Idris Iyam, with the acting team lead, S4P Nigeria, Sybil Ferris, and her state team lead, and all of the company. Today, it is a team lead's dream come true. Kaduna State, the second state in Nigeria, with this flag of S4P. A round of applause. Thank you very much. And very quickly right now, Kaduna State clearly becoming the destination of choice for digital implementations, interventions, a knowledge-based economy, and all of the sustainable value chain of enterprise as a singular digit for multiple recurring prosperity from the state of Kaduna. Right now, tourism. And looking at this documentary on Kaduna State's tourism opportunities, it is about profiling the capacity for the public partner investments that right now are about to be strategically opened up in this geopolitical location in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Kaduna State, tourism opportunities, and a documentary that tells the stories. There's one thing Governor Nassel Erufa E of Kaduna State. Richly diverse cultures and beautiful places. Kaduna's history dates way back from 1912 to 1918 when Lord Frederick Lugard moved the capital of the then northern region. If there's one thing Governor Nassel el e of Kaduna State has made unequivocally clear is his commitment to operate a private sector-driven economy with an eye for the job creation ripple effect. This drive was the motivation for the creation of the Kaduna Investment Promotion Agency, Kadipa, a one-stop shop for all investors, charged with the mandate of removing all bottlenecks for investors and investments in Kaduna State. And so far, this initiative has paid off. Investors from around the world have made Kaduna their investment destination of choice, as several companies with varying capacity of investment magnitude have set up in Kaduna State.
Today, our investment portfolio in the state is over $2.6 billion, um, both in actual investments and in announced investments, and we're still counting. You see new cities being springing up around where these investments are. We see this investment, especially in our um, agro-allied space, actually engaging the people around the area where the investment is in backward integration. So we've seen empowerment of, pe uh, pe empowerment of people. We've seen jobs being created to the people. So across local governments, we have seen investments springing up. We have seen jobs being created. We have seen the economic empowerment of our people, and we're very proud of that. Today, Kaduna State is the most investment-friendly ecosystem in Nigeria and blazing the trail for other states of the country. This was the catch for African Natural Resources and Minerals Limited, a steel manufacturing company, arguably the largest in the whole of Africa, with an investment of $600 million in Kaduna State. The first catch is the location of the raw material, which luckily by the act of God is present in Wuzeni, and Wuzeni is in Kaduna State. But above all, the second catch is the attitude of the government of Kaduna State. You have the Kaduna Investment Corporation set up, and you have set up an online accessibility, and your response time was also good. And the governor in his magnanimity was very friendly to attract us in all ways to be stationed in Kaduna State. So it is these flexibilities and this response to the needs of the investor that encourage us to stay in Kaduna State. You could have been taken out of other states, like Niger State is nearby. Why should we be taking our raw materials there? But because of this attraction, we are staying in Kaduna State. With a steel manufacturing company like the African Natural Resources and Minerals Limited and their ability of producing flat steel sheets, no doubt, the major requirement for an automobile manufacturing company is within reach. This leverage is surely a consideration for Dangote Pojo Automobile Nigeria, DPAN, to set up a 100 daily capacity automobile assembling plant in Kaduna State. DPAN is already at its completion stages. Uh, the company is taking over the franchise of the Pojo brand in Nigeria. So it's going to be assembling Peugeot brands with uh, 301, 5008, 3008, 2008, uh, 508, and the pickup models for now. We are going to commence with the semi knocked down assembly plant where the car body is going to be manufactured in France, painted there and then all the other components will come loose and we assemble them together. Uh, we envisage in the next uh, five years we will move on to CKD assembly, which is the completely knocked down assembly. That is to say the car body is going to be assembled here in Nigeria, painted and all other components assembled in Nigeria. And that is when we will start integrating our local content development so that some parts of the car will be manufactured in Nigeria. This is Channels Television. You've been watching the closing ceremony of the Kaduna Economic Summit, the sixth in its series. Please stay tuned as we return to our regular programming. You've been watching a live Channels Television event.